Uh, I work for Shaw Environmental. Uh, Shaw is a Fortune 500 company worldwide. Uh, we're about a $12 billion a year company with 50,000 employees. Um, and I'm the director of solid waste consulting within the continental United States for Shaw Environmental. Probably the thing to take away from this slide is the uh, different areas of expertise that we have within engineering because even though we're very big in solid waste, uh, we're very big in fossil power, nuclear power, and when we talk about the new technologies of converting uh, garbage to fuel, garbage to syngas, uh, those technologies and those expertises lie within our, within our group. I've been uh, working for SWINC, Northwest Municipal Conference, since its inception. It started in uh, the early days with the Northwest Municipal Conference with Bill Grahams. Uh, we formed the conference, uh, I think it was 88 or 87, and worked with Bill Abolt, uh, worked with Brooke, and now with Dave. And I want to thank you for, uh, for all the times and things that we've done together. I try to give you guys good product. I was the chief engineer on the bale fill, chief engineer for the transfer station, chief engineer doing the Rolling Meadows site. I was your prime witness on the uh, Supreme Court case and the wetlands. And I was also uh, the engineer that helped redesign and retrofit the, the baling transfer station, the top load facility. Um, Probably the most important thing besides, you know, and I didn't mention this before, is as you move forward, we're doing a lot of planning studies uh, around the country right now. What we found is in the late 80s, national law changed and required uh, what's called Subtitle D landfills for the first time had to follow federal laws that had a lot higher standards for landfill design than ever before. And what we found here in Illinois, as well as around, elsewhere around the country, the solid waste system had to adapt. Costs were escalating because the law changed so rapidly. There was a big decrease in available um, disposal volume. And units of government, much like yourself, are trying to react and put infrastructure in place to react to that change. But things are different today. This graph shows capacity down in 1988 in regions one and two of Illinois, which is basically the northern portion of Illinois. We had about 150 million cubic yards of airspace. At that time in the Northwest Municipal Conference, we were having some 70% uh, increases in tipping fees year over year at those landfills because of the decreasing space. Uh, that's not the case today. Today we've got about 3 million cubic yards of airspace and we've got another 200 million cubic yards of airspace that have recently been cited that are coming online soon. So that'll take the airspace availability up to about 500 million cubic yards of airspace within region one or two. Three to four times what we had 20 years ago. So is that solely because of additional landfills being permanent and open? Because of two things. Uh, one is we're doing a better job at diverting. Uh, this slide here shows how uh, Northwest Municipal Conference Swank uh, region has increased its diversion rate up to 45% over that time. But to be honest with you, we've gotten much better at siting landfills than we used to do. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, when, the, when the siting law passed, uh, we, were, we were a little rough at it. We also learned to site much larger facilities as opposed to smaller facilities, so that our ultimate success ratio attempts to cubic yardage has really increased a lot. Can I ask a sure. Has, has pricing gone down as a result of the increasing? Pricing is pricing at landfills is as low as it's been in 10 plus years, and it's stabilized. It's also changed because a lot of the landfills have gone from privately owned to publicly owned. Simultaneously to this, over the last 20 years, we've had a consolidation of the industry. When a family had a 100 million cubic yards of airspace. Uh, they weren't in a hurry to give it away. They figured that, that was, that's money in the bank and they'll be able to get what they ultimately want for it. If you're a publicly traded company, that's not how they think. A uh, publicly traded company needs to get that revenue in every quarter and sell that airspace and, that's not, and the way they book it, they're looking at the revenue in and not the depletion of, of airspace. So the, the influx of publicly traded companies 
has also, I think, made a big push to decrease the, uh, the cost per ton for disposal. Unfortunately, what's happened is that these places are all now between 90 and 120 miles out. The bale fill uh, was one of the attempts to try and site the, uh, a new landfill, greenfield site within uh, the Cook County area. Uh, that was the last attempt to do so. The only other attempt in the last 20 years happened about four or five years ago when Kendall County, the Yorkville area, decided that they wanted to open up their county to try and get the benefit revenue from landfills. Three attempts were made in Kendall County. All of them failed. Uh, so that, that barrier from the private sector industry, which we're relying on in this state to do, has really been pushed out to the Route 39 corridor or somewhere out in that area. Depending on where you live, 90 to 120 miles. And if you take a ring around Chicago, from Newton County, Indiana, to Livingston County, Illinois, to Lee County, Ogle County, Winnebago County, they create a circle of landfills that the city of Chicago is relying on for its disposal capacity. Problem, obviously, is getting it there. We don't have another technology, frankly, in the next 10 years or so to get it to the landfills other than trucking. The rail industry, uh, we've made dozens and dozens of attempts over the last 20 years to try and find a more efficient way to get the garbage from the city out to these areas. Uh, the, rail, uh, the rail industry for this kind of a short haul and as fragmented as the rail industry is, especially around Chicago with the belt system, uh, that's not gonna be a viable alternative, in my opinion, for at least the next 10 years or more. So th the system that you're gonna rely on, ultimately you're gonna rely on a landfill at least for the next 10 years, sits about 90 to 120 miles, you're gonna end up trucking it out there, and obviously fuel costs are gonna probably continue to increase at at least a rate higher than inflation. So what do we do about that? We try to do some resource recovery. Resource recovery talks about reusing material. You take that material and never let it get into the waste stream to begin with. Uh, Mary's group does a great job with that. That's the most efficient because uh, it never enters the system. Recycling, you guys are actually doing a very good job, in my opinion, with recycling. Most of your homes have curbside recycling. Many of them have carts, which significantly increase the diversion amount. And if you uh, compared yourself to other communities in Illinois and within the Midwest, you would, uh, you would compare very favorably. Composting is, you know, the two sides on this thing. The uh, composting is taking the organic fraction. In Illinois, in this our particular region, composting is about as expensive as getting rid of garbage. And there's a big question, at least in my mind, whether that makes economic and environmental sense. And then energy production, taking the garbage and creating energy. Uh, right now that's being done really, if you look at a percentage of the waste stream around the country, there are five or six technologies that are out there a relatively small portion of the waste is actually being uh, used for energy production, with the exception of the waste that is landfilled. Uh, we're getting the gas off the landfills and creating energy from that. The, all the landfills that you guys utilize also have energy and gas recovery. You know, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, I think what's important and I want to take a little bit of issue uh, with what Chris Martell presented a couple months ago. These are the numbers from the state of Illinois uh, uh, waste characterization study that it was put those things in 80 categories. A lot of that, if you go back in the data, where he obtained that data was not from Swank. I believe that the, swing, that, that the garbage that's on the floor of the Swank transfer station is not indicative of the garbage that comes from the city of Chicago and it's not because the garbage is different, it's because your garbage is very uh, homo uh, homeowner based versus commercial based. Each one of your homes, for the most part, uh, have a lot of diversion already within it, have taken a lot of the fiber and a lot of the plastics out. So it's going to be very important when we talk about evaluating technologies that we don't use the statewide studies that may not be indicative of your exact garbage. So the numbers that I have in here are from Chris's presentation, but one of the things I'm going to recommend 
uh, as you move forward is to make sure that we understand what your garbage looks like versus the statewide average. This is just a slide basically telling you the different components and how you guys uh, handle each one. In the diversion area on residential, you're diverting 40 to 45 percent. In the commercial area, you're diverting 30 to 35 percent. And in the C&D debris, 45 to 50 percent. Benchmarking yourselves against similar communities, you guys are actually doing very well uh, on that. You've, gotten a, you've already gone way beyond the low-hanging fruit. Uh, the, the harder you get and the more diversion you get, uh, it's more effort for the return. So I promised Walter I'd give him all his time. Um, I'm going to move a couple ahead here, and I think most of this self is explanatory. I'm going to get to slide 13. Uh, and you need to create a policy decision. A policy decision is this is what we have left with our garbage. Is our policy to create energy? Is that the most important thing? In Illinois, the cost that you get for energy is very low compared to some other states. Do we want to make a policy to divert as much from the landfill as possible? Uh, what is what? What are exactly? Or is our policy to reduce costs? You know, at this point, we've gone very far. We benchmark well. How do we reduce costs? Whoever you hired and whatever your plan goes, it's going to need that kind of policy decision from you guys, so that the planners know where to focus. And then. From that, we take the actual uh, remaining material on the floor of the transfer station, and from your policy decision, evaluate different technologies and do cost-benefit analysis, cost performance, so you can understand the impact, positive or, or negative, from that analysis. These are basically the six options that you have uh, macroscopically. Continue to try and optimize your current system. I think you're probably getting very close to the point of diminishing returns. Organics processing. Right now, we're taking landscape waste, putting it out at the curb at many towns. We have another truck pick it up. Sometimes we take it to the transfer station or it goes to a different landscape waste transfer station. It gets driven out to McHenry County where it's composted. The ultimate cost of that is very high. It would be good, and one of the things we talked about conceptually is if, if there's a way that we could process that compost material here without the drop. And how could we do that here in an environmentally safe way? Because compost facilities are usually in the country because they emit, emit odors, and they need a lot of space. But there are technologies where you can reduce these to very small footprints. They're scalable. They're contained within a, a vessel or some kind of a container box. And should we start testing that technology for the long haul, especially with the property that we have available next to the transfer station, and start testing that technology either ourselves or should we put out an RFP to have a vendor start testing that technology so that ultimately we can get rid of the drive there and back to uh, McHenry County or wherever the, you know, it might be going. I think it's going out to McHenry now. Uh, mixed waste processing, we'll talk more about that. I think that's something that uh, is definitely worthy of, of investigation. Waste conversion technologies is where we take the remaining waste and we convert it to energy, either liquid energy or syngas. Uh, syngas is just a, is, is the first uh, energy that comes off in a pyrolysis type uh, process. That's going to open up a lot, of, a lot of other questions. It's expensive, nobody's really doing it very well now. So as we move into this, there's going to be a lot. Additional construction, demolition, debris recovery. You know, I think, you know, frankly, that many of the facilities that are out there that are diverting 70 to 75 percent of the C&D debris uh, are doing that very successfully. But there's policies that can be implemented via individual towns to increase that rate by requiring everybody to divert that within a, prior to the issue of building permit. And then the special materials. Uh, such as household hazardous waste and so forth. Optimize current system. Uh, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. Target opportunities. You've got a facility there. You've got control of the waste. That should be fairly easy to do. Challenges. You've already done a pretty decent job at this. I'm not sure how much more tweaking we can do there. Organics processing. Um, organics are a big 
piece of the waste, organics in the windrow create odors, but there are other technologies that we should think about doing, and those technologies, I think, uh, would be most successful if they were near your waste centroid, so we're not transporting the, the organics far. Mixed waste processing. Uh, let's see what value we have laying on the floor of the transfer station. Let's go in there and see exactly what we have. Let's do an analysis of putting a dirty MRF. We know that the transfer station is underutilized. What if we put additional equipment in the transfer station to further segregate recyclables out of the material that makes it to the floor? What's the, you know, we know about the market volatility, but what's the value? We can come do that with a sensitivity analysis over time. And then we can back calculate how many dollars per ton that would save for you and what the uh, payback period is where the cost-benefit ratio is. That's probably the one thing that you can do where the technology is fairly well established and the advantage of this is you'd be getting the advantage after it crosses the gate in that when you divert before it gets to your gate, you're not getting paid for it. Once it goes over the scale, you'd get paid for it and then the less that you send to the landfill and the more that you sell in recycling, there's a double potential kick there where you can get a little bit more kick. And this kind of a study because it's not experimental, these things are in place all over, uh, offers very low risk to at least evaluate. I mean, the risk would be the volatility of the markets, which we can sensitize, do sensitivity analysis to evaluate that further. Waste conversion technologies. Mass burn, these are the big incinerators. We're not building any of those in Illinois, I'm pretty sure. Uh, gasification, pyrolysis, waste of fuel are generally all along the lines of taking waste, heating it up in the absence of oxygen uh, to, until it starts giving off gas. It's the same thing that we used to do with coal, charcoal, uh, and we take that gas and we either use that gas for energy or we, uh, or we precipitate that gas and let it and turn it into a liquid fuel. Uh, energy is very cheap in Illinois, energy that we would get off of it. Uh, would have to, you know, we'd have to take that into account. And the other problem that this usually causes is the things that we're trying to get energy out of, plastic paper, we've already pulled out of the waste stream, so we would actually want to put that back in the waste stream to, to get that energy out of those. And sometimes, politically, that's a difficult, uh, difficult argument to make. Anaerobic digestion um, would work for food waste. I don't think it would work for most of the other wastes around here. These are all things that can be studied I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think you should spend a lot of money studying these at any, any great depth. They've been studied by uh, other gut units of government. I've studied them for other units of government. You've got a perfectly good, capable staff that can just go through the other recent studies, put it together, and narrow this down to two or three things and focus your study. Construction demolition debris being handled by the private sector. Uh, right now in your service area. Um, you know, I think it's just an issue of whether additional policy should be developed to you know, force more of that. Special materials, you're doing an excellent job at that. Household hazardous waste, uh, all of the other uh, documents and all the other programs that you have. You guys are doing a very good job at reducing the toxicity of the waste. These programs uh, are fairly expensive on a cost per ton or a cost per pound, uh, but they have a very big uh, uh, environmental impact, a very good environmental impact over time. So conclusions. Uh, resource recovery technologies uh, are out there. We've got about six areas. Uh, the, the board needs to decide what they want to be. Do, are we focused on trying to reduce cost? Are we focused trying to produce energy? Are we focused on trying to get organics out? Uh, and if so, Whatever technologies we evaluate, it's important, obviously in this day and age more than ever, is to do it an evaluation. You've got a very good opportunity because you know what your waste stream is. We've got it in front of us. It needs to be characterized. And then once we characterize what's in there, we can actually take that waste stream and put it through the different technologies, perform a cost-benefit analysis, and then continue to refine that cost-benefit analysis as you move down the uh, implementation phases.